cannot invent and pioneer if you cannot accept failure. We wanted people that were insanely great at what they did. Nobody was making any money at all. Uh, most people thought the internet was going to be a fad. Today on the podcast, we have, I won't say my favorite guest, but this person is now in the three-timer <laughs> club. Um, it's Tommy Griffith. He was on episode number two, which I know everyone remembers, um, where um, that was a very fun one, giving this sort of click-minded in his uh, past life as far as running SEO at Airbnb. He was on episode 60, where we talk about personal finance as a founder, and we have some strong opinions in that one. Um, Tommy recently wrote a blog post. He likes to go down this tangent every few years where he goes very deep and tells us about what he's doing at his company. Uh, it's called Relentless Simplicity, where he basically contradicts everything he said before, but he's very open. <laughs> talks about his business. He's you've like, dude, you've literally more than like tripled the business to 2.3 million, which is insane. But uh, Tommy, thank you for finally coming back on. I send you, I think, an email every month. Like, will you please come back on? So pumped to, to chat. <laughs> yeah, Jim, thanks for, for having me on the show. I uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, Three man. timer club. That's, uh, do you guys do certificates? Can I put something on my fridge or something like that? Uh, absolutely. I got to tell, tell mom about that. The, the click-minded <laughs> certificate template. I'll just replace the the name, but uh, perfect. Members perfect. only jacket, but um, but yeah. Well, first, like introduce yourself, just so people have context. Like, wait, who is Tommy? What what do you do? Yeah, so my name is Tommy Griffith. I run a digital marketing documentation and online course company called ClickMinded. Uh, it started off as a side project about 10 years ago. I was teaching search engine optimization classes on the weekends in co-working spaces in San Francisco. Uh, it turned into an online course for a few years, and then it turned into a suite of online courses for a few years. And now we mostly work on writing really comprehensive SOPs, checklists, and templates for marketers and marketing teams. So yeah, and and my summary of it is Tommy was running SEO for Airbnb, read the four hour work week and was like, F it, I'm out of here. Traveled the world. He's super humble, but he, I wish you were more active on Instagram because I know you'd be in um, hammocks across <laughs> the world running this company. But I really respect what Tommy's done because you, you first you built essentially before like being a solo founder was cool you built this like very big six figure like solo business yourself but then you started to go down this path of, of scaling it you've you hired two key people that allowed you to like double and triple revenue and now you've literally gone from like under 1 million to over 2.3 by doing something that i love which is not sexy work that is just making a killing SOPs for agencies. We use it because we're like, oh crap, what do we do for GA4? I'm like, oh, click mind, it'll have what we need to help with that migration. Um, but um, but no, man, I'm I'm pumped to get into it. You're you're my spirit animal whenever I'm in like nine back to back <laughs> meetings. I'm like, Tommy would be would be so disappointed. Um, but what we want to talk about today, um, is that is that okay? I like my description of you better. Is that okay? Yeah, let's go with, with your description. I like that better too. Uh, anything anything involving spirit animals, I think is a better description. That's, Absolutely. That works for me. <laughs> that, that was the goal. Um, so Tommy wrote this post called Relentless Simplicity, um, really talking about making a big pivot in your company um, that was not your idea. And it was not your co-founder's idea. It was someone else who you met on Upwork who is now your CEO. But before we even get into that, like, <laughs> you and I kind of both do this like build in public thing where we're like, you know what, let's just share it with the world. I, I like doing it one, because that's how I learn from other people, but two selfishly, it's a great marketing tactic where people can really like get to know you and feel like they're a part of the company. But like whenever you write this and you hit publish, like what is that feeling when you like put your numbers out there and you're exposed? Yeah, I mean, my I think my style of doing this stuff and your style are, are a little bit different. I I kind of like your style better. I like following you and seeing what you tweet 
out and what you write about and all that. And you're more frequent about it and you're kind of funnier about it. I write like one monster post every like two or three years. And I think for me, it's like, it's more of a like therapy. Like I should probably just get a therapist instead, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like probably like more convenient and cheaper to do that. But instead I like build it up and then uh, it's just my my coping mechanism for not not getting a therapist, I guess. But uh, yeah, I guess the um, the trend has been that I've always had a side project for the last 10 years. I've worked on that side project. And then like funny things happen or interesting things happen. And then I just write about it. And uh, people seem to like it. The very first one was a long time ago when I just like, I did a deal with AppSumo and it just kind of blew my mind. Like that was when internet marketing finally hit me. It's like AppSumo can send out one email to their users. And all of a sudden they have a thousand new customers in a couple of hours, right? And like, so I just wrote this post like, this would have been back in maybe 2014. As I said, like, here's all the numbers. Here's what AppSumo took from a revenue share. Here's how many customers we added. Here's like what we we're going to upsell to them. And uh, people loved it. And then I wrote a, a similar one. I kind of quit my job and went, um, uh, was work, wrote a similar one about how my side project had eclipsed my salary at Airbnb and just like laid out the numbers and like, what's the trade off? And then the next one was like, how I left Airbnb to go full-time on it. And I brought on a co-founder um, and laid out all the revenue numbers. And then this one is the latest installment, I guess, which is like uh, my co-founder and I kind of hit a ceiling. We had an employee uh, that was been working for us for a few years and was basically screaming at the top of his lungs for us to change our strategy. We said no for multiple years. We wanted to stick to our plan. And then when we finally gave in and did his thing, it was like a massive success. We got out of the way, we made him the CEO and, and everything took off from there. So that was kind of the, the journey was like just these very kind of personal sort of open kimono posts where I just lay out all the numbers and my reasoning for it and, and what happened. And it, 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 it seems to resonate with people, especially kind of uh, the entrepreneurial scene. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I love it reading from you and from other people. And you kind of have to do the numbers because if you don't do the numbers, you're like, oh, we grew by 30%. And then you move on. It's like, okay, I don't really understand it. But whenever you can actually learn and see the numbers, see the growth, it, it just gives so much more color to it. And I, if you're going to do it, it's like, go all in. I believe a quote from Tommy is don't half asset, full asset or whatever you say. So, um, <laughs> so no, I, I love it. And so I don't know, but whenever I publish mine, I hit publish and then I'm usually like, oh crap, immediate regret and you want to delete it. But then you're like, oh, well, it's already out there. Um, and then right. also at the end of the day, it, sure. not, none of this matters. So it's like, whatever. Um, so <laughs> let, let's talk about these inflection points. So um, one thing that I think is interesting, you've been really good at two things, finding amazing talent in um, unest assuming places where people don't normally go and then two, empowering them to do good things and you're down to give up your company as far as equity you're down to give up a title um and so i want to hit on this like talk through like working with andre and like the signals that like one this guy is strong and then two you changed your mind on how the business should go. Like that, that's hard because there's a lot of ego with the business and a company. CEOs are supposed to be visionaries and lead the vision. But you're like, no, I'm going to do what this person I found on Upwork said we should do. Like kind of walk through that for people because I think it's really hard. People put a lot of pressure on themselves to be this rainmaker of ideas. Yeah, when you say it like that, it's really funny. Uh I mean, Andre, Andre and I are so close now and we've been working together for so long, but, but you're for so long, but you're right. At the end of the day, he's a guy from Upwork that we made the CEO, which is like, <laughs> <laughs> it's a very punchy, you know, that's, that, that's a very clickbaity tweet that'll probably work. Maybe I'll have to throw that in there somewhere. Tag somewhere. that, tag that. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny now, Jim, because now it's happened twice where I did the first round of the company. My, my now co-founder had a better vision than I did. And so I sort of got out of the way and let him run things. And then someone that we had hired a couple of years later had a better vision than both of us. And we both kind of, kind of got out of the way. Um, <clears throat> and so it's now happened twice. And it's interesting because you're right. Like 
if you're thinking about it theoretically, it's easy to say, oh, if you're a founder, you know, of course your ego is going to be a little bit tied up into this. And of course you're going to be like more biased to your own decisions. And you kind of understand if, if a CEO or founder or whatever is more um, adamant about their vision. But I actually would argue the opposite, or at least recommend anyone listening to strongly consider the opposite, because I had the, the, the exact opposite experience, which is like, the coolest thing in the world is building something that someone else cares about. And in my case, cares about probably more than me. I mean, the, 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 the members of the team now, like, you know, I wrote the first 50 or 100 blog posts. I wrote the first couple SOPs. I did the first couple of years on my own. But now some of the people on the team have done way more than me contributed way more to kind of the brand and the identity and the content and acquired more customers than me. And they, they're they kind of more invested than me. And it's like the coolest thing in the world, in my opinion, to, to create something out of nothing and have someone else like carry it on for you. That to me is infinitely more cool than deciding the next chapter of things you know what i mean because they can put their own spin on it and they and they give their own kind of meaning to it and that kind of stuff so um i would actually argue that that it's a lot easier than trying to hold the vision the entire time um and and a lot more fun too no that that's so true i couldn't agree more like that's the best thing is like you bring in people you're aligned on the same values and then they have ideas you didn't think of. And then when you put them into action, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm just going to get out of your way. Because as a founder, as a business owner, there's so much pressure and weight you have at all times. And when someone comes in and is like, oh, let me take that dumbbell off your shoulder and like, oh, by the way, we don't even need that. And they take it to the next level. You're like, oh my gosh, this is so much more fun. Um, and just, right. it shows you have that growth mindset too, to always be evolving and changing. But like talk, like I actually want to get into the weeds because I think it's helpful for people to hear how you saw signals on like why you should change. And then when you made that pivot, because like for people to know, like you're doing courses, it was doing well. Um, and then you all kind of automate it and it's going very well to seven figures. Sounds like there's a plateau, but then you pivot to SOPs, like get into the details of like the signals. And then like when you made that hard move to pivot, or maybe it wasn't a hard move to pivot and it was an experiment that just kind of snowballed. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I guess part of writing this post is trying to figure it out myself. So, so I might, my opinions might change on this over the next days and weeks, and maybe I'll, maybe someone else will read it and fake and spot something I didn't spot. But the basic idea was, um, we had one online course, we expanded to seven online courses, one of which was yours. You teach, as you know, one of the, one of the courses really? at ClickMind, our sales funnel course, sign up today. Sign up today, referral <laughs> code, use my referral code. <laughs> right, right. Use Jim's <laughs> referral code. Um, as part of that process, we, we basically went in and we said, we're going to be a digital marketing general assembly, or we're going to be a an online equivalent of a digital marketing graduate degree, or we're going to be one of these kind of like Code Academy, Coursera sort of competitors, LinkedIn Learning, Linda, one of these guys. Um, this would have been back in 2017. As we were creating these courses, one of the pieces of feedback we kept getting from users was like, this is great, but it, it's still not clear to me how to get started. And so one of the things we said was, okay, you know what? Why don't we give a bunch of these users some of our SOPs? We had already created SOPs for ourselves. We were using them in Google Drive for our own team. And we kind of surveyed our users and said like, hey, if we open this up to you guys, would you use it? And they said, yes, absolutely. We ended up making it kind of a side piece product, right? So our core offering were these courses and we used the SOP access to our SOP library as like a sweetener, as like a bonus. So we would say, hey, enroll in this course and you'll get access to this, this thing for a limited amount of time or buy all these courses and you'll get access. And it was kind of this like, let's see if this pushes users across the, the finish line kind of thing. What happened and the, the, in hindsight, the massive mistake we made was there were multiple signals of people screaming as loud as they can that they the thing they wanted was the bonus content, not the actual content. It was things like, um, you know, 
one of the default offerings we had was like three months access to the SOP library. And like when people's three month access ran out, they didn't realize that at the time and they like lost their minds that they had <laughs> lost access, right? Or, you know, finding our contact form, calling us, texting us, being like, how do I buy this, right? Um, people saying, uh, people sharing logins, like breaking our terms of service and like letting, you know, 10 or 20 people into the account and like, like breaking the terms. Uh, people emailing saying, you know, how do I get my team of 50 on here? And so they're just like, people were going out of their way to like tell us they wanted to sign up. And we were like annoyed by it. We were, <laughs> we were like, you know, hey, we're working on courses over here. And we were like, it was in, in hindsight, it was just incredibly arrogant, incredibly navel gazy. Uh, what do they call it now? Main character syndrome, right? Like, like yeah. we had this vision that we were, we were an ed tech company and we had this like very straightforward path. And the thing that made it hard to pivot was that it was working. The company was growing. We were yeah. doing like, we were, we were very proud of what we were doing and we thought we had the best, you know, digital marketing courses in the world. And we wanted to keep our foot on the gas on that, which is like pretty reasonable. I think the other big factor around this was, and a lot of people have this problem, was sunk cost fallacy. Oh, you know, man. we'd yeah. spent, we like, and this is so hard to, to, to get around in a lot of different industries, not just entrepreneurship, but, but so many things. It could be, you know, finances, Wall Street, dating, I mean, health, like sunk cost fallacy drives a lot of problems, right? And so we had just spent, you know, we found, went and found seven different instructors for courses. We had 85 hours of HD video. We had created this massive email marketing funnel, all these things, and intermittently getting emails from users saying like, I just want the SOPs. I don't want the courses. <laughs> it was like, it was like, I have to ignore this because I'll go insane if we wasted all this time on, on, on courses. Right. So, um, we just had this sort of issue where if the core thing we had been doing had failed, maybe it would have been easier to pivot, but it was sort of growing at like, you know, 20 to 30% and, and uh, was worth um, sort of continuing to work on in our heads. And it made it easier to ignore this other opportunity. The other giant mistake I made was just straight up not listening to someone who had done this before. So Andre, like I mentioned, he was a freelancer that we found on uh, Upwork, which is like a freelance marketplace. And um, there's this amazing, uh, there's this really simple but great tweet a couple of years ago from this guy, the guy who ran that design agency, Tiny, um, Andrew. Oh, Wilkinson. Andrew Wilkinson. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love this guy. And he tweeted out something. And it was so simple. It was just like, I can't believe it took me this long to figure it out, but whenever you're hiring, here's how to, here's how to do it. Step one, figure out what you want the person to do. Step two, make sure they've done that before. <laughs> and like that was it. Right. And it was just like, there's no way it's that simple. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's exactly what happened with Andre. He had been working at a European tech company. He, they, they had almost no paid advertising presence and he turned them into a seven figure company almost overnight uh through paid ads so he had been at his day job he was only working part-time at ClickMind, about 10 hours a week and so all of his other hours was at this other company building them up to a seven figure business through paid ads he was doing this every day on someone else's dime and so he came to us and said like hey guys like I know I only have 10 hours a week here, but like, you're doing this wrong. <laughs> you need to change the pricing, figure out an ad campaign, push this to cold traffic. I've been doing this at this other company for two years. If you ever change your mind, like, let me know, right? And we just went out of our way to say no for, for, for probably a year or two. <laughs> and when we finally gave in, surprise, surprise, it exploded. <laughs> and it did really, really well. So I guess it's a long answer, but in summary, I think the thing was like, first we had very obvious product market fit that we were kind of ignoring because we, we had it in two places and yeah. it was hard to disseminate like a better fit 
from one over the other because of sunk cost fallacy. Like we had invested more time, energy, and effort into these massive high quality HD courses. And we thought there's no way people just want Google Docs instead. There's no way, right? That was the first mistake. The next mistake was not listening to someone who had done this before. And he just had very clearly had experience doing this and his record uh, proved that. We could have gotten to a binary yes, no decision way faster if we had just given him room to experiment. If we had gone, if I could go back in time and said, here's 500 bucks. The first chance he said, you guys should do this. If we had said, here's, here's a thousand dollars, here's $500. Like, like, can you get this done by this weekend? Let me know. That would have, it would have solved everything. But uh, I think those two big things is what the, the lack of recognizing product market fit and not listening to someone who had done it already before was really what would cause a lot of the problem. Yeah. And um, one quote from the blog post that you had cracked me up talking about you, you found Andre to be like someone entering, doing data entry, but you didn't realize you were striking gold. And he said, my co-founder Eduardo hired him to do a menial data entry task, which was like bringing a rocket launcher to a gender reveal party, comically unnecessary. And so, (laughs) so you unleash him, you decide, let's test this. When was the writing on the wall where you're like, oh, this is our new business? Like, how long did it take? Was it instantaneous? Was it after spending a grand? Or was it after three to six months? It was instantaneous. Uh, It was, I mean, within one week. Uh, to, 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 to give you the context, yeah, we, he, he started with a $50 a day campaign and the very first full month of paid advertising, it was, he had brought us up to $250,000 in revenue. <laughs> um, and so that was the moment in time where it was like, um, okay, we're going to do your thing now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's really what it came down to. There's there's some other backstory there as well. The first version of the product, when it was just a bonus, a sweetener, Andre created that. So he was just heavily invested in this product. He knew who it was for. He designed the first version of it. He understood it frontwards and backwards. Um, ClickMinded was the sort of platform that let him do that. And so he sort of c- created it and built it up over many years. And so he wasn't cold off the street, knew exactly what to do. He he had been there from day one. And I think um, in hindsight, if, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you're listening to this now and you have a team, if there's someone on your team who has been in the very early days of a product and they've seen that evolve, trust them. Just trust them a little bit more than feels comfortable and kind of get out of the way a little bit because there's a good chance they understand it better than you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And just to summarize, this guy is working 10, by the way, he has an awesome beard. It's worth calling out. So this, what do you call him? Like a bearded knight or something? Um, <laughs> he He's working 10 hours a week and he's helping you all of a sudden make 200, a quarter million in sales um, part-time as a side thing. And so the one thing that I kind of struggle with, because I agree with your advice, because I really struggle with this, is like, do you hire the, hire the been there, done that, like the Andre, or do you hire the up and comer? And obviously, like, there's cases for both. Like, in my case, Jonathan, he's been working at a premium CRO agency. He knew how to do it. I hired him. All of a sudden, we're like at, at, at the seven figure mark. But then you've had other instances where you you get that up and comer and you kind of catch that lightning in a bottle at the right time. And they're the right fit. There's a steeper learning curve. It could take longer, but it's, um, I, I really struggle with that because with key roles, I'm trying to figure out like, which path do you go down? So um, anyway, no question there. But like, as you're saying that, I'm like thinking through it myself. It's like, with which roles do you get the been there, done that versus which roles do you get the up and comer? Yeah, I mean, the, um, like the Andrew, Wilkinson recommendation would be to never go for the up and comer, to never hire for the raw talent and to, uh, that the most, it doesn't mean that raw talent will never work. It's just that if you're going from pure probabilities perspective, right, it's like someone who had done that role before it's, it's a little bit more likely, but you know, what's interesting. Um, 
is that like Andre now has been, it's coming up on two years that he'll have been the CEO of the business. But the stuff that's actually been, of course, finding that next leg of growth was like a massive part of it. But the stuff that he's been sneaky, crazy good at has been all the other things around that. Like when we have our weekly and, and quarterly meetings, it's very pro now. Everything's super buttoned up. Like we have like, uh, he really treats, you know, it's essentially a lifestyle business and he really treats it with like a level of rigor that's like an investor shareholder meeting. And it's really serious. And um, he's very diligent and he's uh, very thoughtful and everyone loves working for him. So like, it, funny enough, like, yeah, he found this massive lever of growth for us in paid advertising, but he's been like incredible for like HR and team morale and stuff wow. like that. And so, so, so part of the, the thing is like, you can't, it's just really hard to know exactly what the impact of, of someone is going to be. And this is one of the other sneaky side benefits of getting out of the way as the CEO is you, it, if you stay in that role of the kind of founder CEO, even if you give other people a shot and you roll the dice on them and you bring them in, you're still kind of building the business around you. Yeah. You know, and you can't ever get away from that until you actually walk away, until you actually take a diminished role. And so like the needs of the company with Andre running it are very different from the needs of the company with Eduardo, my co-founder running it, which is very different from the needs of the company if I was running it. And so the 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 puzzle or like the Jenga pieces move around a lot when you when you bring that person on and it's just worth worth uh worth keeping in mind I think is it's it's very hard to uh to to tell what the outcome is going to be unless you just pull the trigger and do it. Yeah. So why why is Andre the CEO? How did that come to be? Because clearly he found the lever. You see he has these other skills. Um, was that your goal? Was that his goal? Was it everybody? It was the right thing? And the reason why I ask is a lot of people want to build these companies that can run without them. You, you've landed that plane pretty well in the sense that you now have a CEO. So I'd, I'd love to hear how that happened or evolved. Yeah. I mean, it was just exactly that story I told you. Uh, we said, hey, like we were running all these experiments. Like, should we do B2B sales? Should we create a SaaS? Should we become a marketplace? Should we invest in automation? Should we do, should we create a community? I mean, like a million different things. This was the one that was an overnight success. And we basically said, okay, we're a Google Docs company now. <laughs> <laughs> like we are a white label documentation company powering the back end operations of consultancies and agencies. This is very different from courses. Um, Andre created this product from the day one. He's incredibly gifted at paid ads. He'd be a way better fit than us. Let's make him the CEO. And I think um, this is another one of these things that a lot of people forget. It's it, it's not all just, I can't speak for Andre necessarily, but like, it's not all just stock and equity and money. When Eduardo, my co-founder originally came on board, some of the things that were really important to him were like, he wanted to be with his girlfriend uh, and and like his current company wouldn't let him work remote. He, he didn't want to be told what to do. He didn't want a manager. He wanted like to, to be able to count his own schedule. And that was like a huge factor in his decision matrix. If you were to ask Andre privately, I think a, a part of him deep down wanted to run a company, wanted to give to be given a shot, didn't want to be nomading around uh, and and pulling together upwork jobs for a while, wanted to have, you know, to dictate the schedule and the product and the pricing and what we do and 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 take responsibility for that. Um, and so I think a big factor that was kind of non-monetary at all, it was kind of like life goal, personal satisfaction, dopamine, oxytocin kind of stuff. And especially if someone hasn't done that before, it's a huge, it can be a huge factor in them deciding to join you. So if you're listening to this podcast and you're, you're, you're thinking about giving someone like a leadership role or, or a CEO role, consider all the non-monetary things that are, that are huge pluses in their in their pluses and minus column because they're they they might be more valuable than you think it's so true knowing what they care about what their why their mission and it's like design the role for them I, I totally agree so i do want to get into like the whole idea of simplicity and how you kind of use that to run like 
to go to this next level. But I actually want to get a little bit to the details of growth because going from like a million to like 2.3, I mean, you've like tripled revenue in two years. Get into the details of that. It's doing 2.3 and in, in, in million in sales. Where's that growth coming from? Is it paid acquisition? You say he's very good at Facebook. You guys were phenomenal at SEO. Is that still driving it? Um, what is that key lever? Yeah, the the key new lever is paid advertising. All of our old channels are still working. Um, SEO is a huge driver for us. Um, our our funnel and kind of our automations are a big part of it. But the sort of new thing is cold traffic from paid ads, um, which which needed to happen because of a pricing change. Our, 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 our courses are very expensive. They're great, but they're very expensive. And it's very hard to sell to cold traffic on an expensive product, right? So, uh, the, but in terms of simplicity, this is part one of the funny parts about this whole story. It's like we had all these complicated situations and, and ideas and automations and they were working but the thing that worked way, way better was the very simple implementation. The stuff that Andre's doing is very simple. He'd be the first one to admit that. It's an ad pointing to a landing page. It's a low dollar offer that everybody takes. And then it's a high dollar offer that some people take. There's nothing secret about that. Every, every YouTube tutorial on how to do Facebook ads will tell you this. There's nothing really there. Um, but we just decided to do all of the insanely complicated stuff first before trying the simple one. <laughs> and, you know, we, we talk about like this idea of, um, you know, what is it? The IQ bell curve as far as, you know, or kind of kind of break that down because you've kind of had this evolution because you talked about let's do all the hard marketing things like the automate everything have a webinar um, let's make exceptions for everybody but you had to go down this complicated path to figure out mm -hmm. simplicity right and so I don't know we as marketers and founders you want to like think you have this secret sauce and this custom formula but it's really like the more you get into it it's like just keep it simple right yeah so I mean. Pretty much the reason why I wrote this blog post is because I kept seeing this meme show up. I don't know if you've seen it or maybe you can post it in the show notes, but it's called the IQ bell curve meme. And uh, it's so funny. And I, I, I keep seeing it show up in my life in not just business, but like other outrageous areas. I'm just pulling up like the definition I have over here. But the, the idea is like, we all think we're smarter than we are. And in not just business, but all these categories of my life, I've found myself doing this. And the description of the meme is like, it's basically making fun of average people who think that they're smart. And so it's used <laughs> to convey this idea that, you know, dumb people use a simple solution because they're dumb. Average people use a complex solution because they think they're smart. Smart people use a simple solution because they're smart is the basic idea. And you can just see this in so many areas of life. And I just listed a bunch of examples like productivity tools, right? The average the average guy, it's like Asana, Trello, Notion, Rome, Evernote, ClickUp, Second Brain, Zapier, Monday, Pomodoro timers, Moleskin <laughs> notebooks, right? But like the dummy and the genius, it's like notepad.txt or like Apple yeah. Notes, right? Uh, with fitness is another one like Atkins, keto, paleo, vegan, whole 30, <laughs> fasting, CrossFit, soul cycle, hot yoga, glucose monitor. And the dummy and the, the genius, it's like eat less and move more, right? Yeah. Investing is another one. Options, crypto, gold, SPACs, meme stocks, hedging, all weather portfolio, angel investing. And the dummy and the genius, it's like buy the S&P 500, right? right? Yeah. So it's just... I, I just kept seeing this show up in my life and I kept being that the, in the meme word, or the meme term is called the midwit, the guy in the middle yeah. <laughs> who just decides, decides he, it can't, life can't be that simple. I have to make it complicated. And uh, I just kept seeing these moments in my life where like a brand new dumb newbie and a 10 year experienced veteran Jedi were like doing the same simple thing. And it's always 
the average mediocre person in the middle overcomplicating things. And I say that in an endearing way as being the average mediocre person in the middle, trying all the complicated stuff first before going back into a more, much more simple sort of way to implement. You know what I mean? I know. It makes me cringe as I think at my older self, like trying to explain to a client about how we run Facebook ads and how we like created the new like formula for relativity or something. And it, it's like now when I do these like startup talks, they're like, what's the key to like making a startup that works? I'm like, solve a problem that people have. And it's like kind of <laughs> underwhelming and I try and spice it up, but I'm like, that's kind of just it. And then I'll like walk away and people are just like, what a dummy. But I'm like, that's kind of it. You know, it's that simple. But um, yeah, that one hit a little too close to home, but it, but it's so true. And so like you talk about simplicity and you mentioned some like conventional wisdom that you have around it. Like kind of elaborate on those that like people can take home from whether it's the, the mom's wisdom or to cutting your losses, like some things you've done to, to help you. Yeah. So uh, if you buy into this idea that like maybe the simple way is better, maybe simplifying it is actually very Jedi and more advanced, it, it doesn't mean that it's easy. Simple does not mean easy. And the, my favorite example of this, this guy, um, I don't know if you follow this guy, Zach Cantor. Um, mm -mm. A couple years ago now, he tweeted out something that blew my mind. It forced me to read this book. He compared two incredibly different books, which was the first one was uh, Marie Kondo, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. Have you heard about this book, The Personal uh, Organizer? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you should see my closet right now, man. I'm, 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 yeah. I'm doing it. You fully color coordinated and all that over there. I'm, I'm at uh, peace with only things that bring me joy right now in my closet. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, they only spark joy, right? So <laughs> this guy, this guy tweets out this example. He talks about this for anyone who hasn't read it, or I she's got a Netflix show now, apparently, but um, it's this personal organizer from Japan named Marie Kondo. And she writes about how you know personal organizing is there's all these things in this book, right? But the one sentence description of the book is throw away everything you don't absolutely love, right? There's this, there's this other book um, by the Netflix co-founder. It's called No Rules Rules. And it's like ha the story of Netflix and how they got started and all this. This is a long book. But the one sentence description of it is fire your B players, right? Fire your B and C players, right? And the guy, this guy, Zach Cantor, he tweeted about this. He he tweeted about these two very different books. And he, but he says the, the takeaway from both of them is the same. You don't need to read the book. You could sit there in the bookstore and read the first <laughs> sentence. And everyone does the same thing. They, they read the first sentence, throw away everything you don't absolutely love. And everyone reacts the same way. They say, oh, okay, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to throw away everything I don't love. But let me just keep reading and we'll see where this goes, <laughs> right? And it's, it's the same thing with the Netflix thing. Say, you say, fire all of your B players. And you say, okay, well, I'm not going to do that, but let's see where this goes. Both of these things are simple, but not easy, right? They're very, very simple ideas. It does not mean that they're necessarily easy. And so, um, you know, some of this stuff, like, like in our business now that we're doing, it is a lot more simple. It doesn't necessarily mean we're, we're kicking back and drinking coconuts and hanging out on hammocks all the time. It's, it's not necessarily that. It just means that the goal and the constraints and the what we have to do every day is incredibly narrow and straightforward. And that is a huge tailwind. It helps a lot, right? To simplify that kind of stuff. So some of the other examples I talked about in this post, is like a simple but, but not easy one is like your mom's non-negotiables, right? Everyone's mom had non-negotiables. For me, it was, you're brushing your damn teeth, you're going <laughs> to school and you're not quitting. Right. And like that last one, such a good get... one. We had that one as well. That that's such a strong one. It's it, it's a strong one. It's a strong one. You had to finish the season. You had to finish the, the, the end of the school year. If you pick up piano, you have to do it until like the end of the summer or whatever it is, but like, you can't quit. Um, but the point there is like, those rules were simple, but they were not easy as a kid. Right. Um, another, another one was like, um, Almost everything has happened before. I just keep reading these books, like um, Ray Dalio's book. I don't know if you read that one. Principles. Um, so good. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, wanting. Do you read this one, Luke Burgess? I haven't. Um, I've read Influence, but I need to do Wanting. Mm-hmm. You're like the third person that's brought that one up. It's it's a great one. But all of these are basic. It's basically you know zoom out, look at all of human evolution, and look at all of our history. And it turns out like we are basically hairless ape algorithms doing the same things over and over again for a hundred thousand years. It's basically like what these books all say, right? And that idea, and it keeps coming up in finance and in marketing and in uh, like all these other things, that idea is simple, but it's not, it doesn't mean life is suddenly easy, right? It doesn't yeah. suddenly mean that like you can read people's minds, but that, that sort of c- concept that like you can use history to predict future markets and all that is, is simple, but, but not easy, you know? Yeah. I love that um, one. Cause even like as an agency owner, like when just starting, it's like, we're going to do it completely different. We're the non-agency agency. We're so different from the others. And then as you get into it, you know what? People have been doing service-based businesses for a very long time. I should just learn from those people and we can innovate on our top 2% of things to be positioned different, but it's like, just do what everybody else has done that has thrived in this. It's like, you are not a special snowflake in the most positive way. Right. Exactly. That's a great, that's a great example. Um, the last one I'll say, and this one was this one, it may not have fit the post as much, but it, it's affected me so personally that I wanted to talk about it, which was relentlessly cutting your losses. I want to, I want to go deep on this. This one, I got some major FOMO, but go deep on this. Okay. I'd love to, I'd love to hear it. I mean, the, The basic idea for me is that I think sunk cost fallacy is the biggest driver of low quality decisions in the world. I think sunk cost fallacy causes more heartache and heartburn and trauma and sadness in the world than anything, because it's really, really, really hard for us to get to get through this. And one of the reasons that uh, Cialdini talks about this in influence and it's his rule on commitment and consistency. Apparently this is like a biological thing. Like we are sort of wired to like find inconsistencies. It's like a tribal thing. Like when we see someone being inconsistent, like a stranger comes up to you in the middle of the street or like someone's doing something that you weren't expecting. You're sort of like, your like red flags go off a little bit, your sirens go off. And it's like a human evolutionary thing. So we're also wired in the reverse to want to be consistent. We want to be viewed as a consistent person to our family, to our kids, to our, to our friends. We like, because we want to see that in other people, we want it for ourselves. And so we carry this over in this bizarre way where we think that our current thoughts, feelings, and actions have to match our past thoughts, feelings, and actions. And for some things that might make sense, but in the current modern world, it's ridiculous. You don't, you don't have to always like the New England Patriots for forever. You don't have to always love the playing the piano for forever. You don't have yeah. to always do, do the keto diet for forever. Right. But like we build up these bizarre, you know, people build like a, a brand presence online or they support a politician or they like, they, they make some public, uh, prediction that something's going to happen. And then they just contort themselves in bizarre ways to like fit their past sort of actions. They don't give themselves any wiggle room to, to change. Right. This happened with me when I, I, I moved to Miami. I, uh, it was the middle of COVID. I moved to Miami. I didn't know where I wanted to live in the U S And everything made sense on paper, right? Like Miami's this, you know, it's this warm climate. All these people were moving there. The the tax scheme is really good. There's like all these reasons to go there. And I got there and I moved in and I got an apartment and I signed a one-year lease and I was miserable. I was absolutely (laughs) miserable. I hated it. And I found myself, this actually happened with my, with Andre and Eduardo, with my co-founders. I, uh, I, I, we had a team meeting. I flew out to see them. I was very unhappy with Miami, but I was lying to people. I oh. caught myself lying to people. And they'd say, how's Miami? And I'd say, it's amazing and this and that. And it's so great. And look at my apartment and look at how great it is. I just see you with this my, amazing tan and like a linen shirt, half unbuttoned, just killing all it. All <laughs> this, right? All this. And so, and my, my co-founder Eduardo said, he just looked at me very calmly. You know, he's kind of more of an engineer. He's very straightforward. He doesn't mess around at all. He just looked at me and he says, oh, that's interesting. I hate Miami. And, uh, and I was like, 
And I was like, I got very defensive. I was very, very, and why, and why do you hate it? And this and that. And I was giving all these reasons for it. And he like, didn't even try and fight back. He just said, uh, that, yeah, that's fine. I just, I can't stand it. And he said, he's from Venezuela. And he said, Miami is like LA for Latin America. I just hate it. Mm, <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. He just had an opinion. It didn't matter what mine was. He just said his opinion and walked away. And for like a week, I've, I've, I've talked with him about this, but for like a week afterwards, I was sitting there and I was like, I was trying to unpack that. I was like, why did I lie to a friend yeah. and a yeah. co-founder about something that didn't matter? Yeah. Why did I, why did I care? And the reason why is because I was trying to be consistent, right? Why am I living in Miami if I hate it? Why would I be there? Like, like my, my story had to line up in my head. Totally. And so I was, I was committing sunk cost fallacy. I was living in a city where I didn't want to be there, but I had signed a lease and I had told 20 people I'd moved there. And I, <laughs> you know, I was sort of, I had done these things. And once I sort of realized that I packed up all my stuff and left and moved to New York and in New York, it was, I shouldn't have gone to New York. Like the, my apartment was twice as expensive. It, the taxes are way higher. Like I got half the apartment for twice the price. There's all these reasons to hate New York. And I just love it here. I absolutely love the city for, and there's, there's on paper, it makes absolutely no sense, but I'm like much happier and comfortable and, and excited to be here. And so I just personally have caught myself lying to myself and to other people around meaningless, like not nefarious, but just like pointless sort of things because my, my story had to line up in my own head. And I have a funny feeling that a lot of people do this. So I wanted to talk to talk about this publicly, sunk cost fallacy and relentlessly cutting your losses. Simple, but not easy. It's so true because you kind of like, even like how I, I put this as how family members view you at a time in your life. Oh, you're the basketball player. You're the academic person. You're this. And you feel like because that labels on you, you have to always kind of like, live up to that or be that or that's how they see you in your mind and sometimes it's easy to break away other times you're like oh that's the label i've been put into and i, I have to hold that and it's um i think it takes some real self-awareness to be able to do that or it takes a good co-founder that can just kind of shoot you straight to put perspective into things but, um, <laughs> no man you're 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 giving me a therapy session here that that's super interesting and another thing that you said that was super interesting because you talk about simplicity, and I think it also means blocking things out. You had this comment around, you know, rel um, you know, just in addition to relentlessly cutting your losses, like what to do around your attention. And you said like your attention has a dollar value. Every alert, notification, text message, email, and social media post you see has a dollar value. The next time you get an unsolicited message, instead of dismissing it, and waiting for it to happen again, imagine that every dollar being deducted, every dollar amount being deducted from your bank account. And I think about that because I am so into my email. I'm so into Slack. Notifications can drive my day. I'm reading um, the book, um, Buy Back Your Time by Dan Martell. And he talks about if you really want to be serious about this, the first thing you do, get an executive assistant, give them your calendar and your email because it's sucking the creativity out of your business because you're not focusing on the one thing. And I think you have been very disciplined about where to block things and where to say no to things. But ha has that been big with you and the team going to that next level? Yeah, I mean, I, I have not forced anyone on the team to do this. Maybe we should. <laughs> I, I just, it took me, it took me long enough to just get this sorted on my own. Um, but the idea here is, I, I think the funny way to think about this one, yeah, the, the rule I wrote was uh, simple, but not easy. Be aggressively intentional with your technology. Yeah. And that the, the, the really easy way to think about this is this, like, and this is another dorky historical sort of context thing, but like humans have been around for 100,000, 200,000, 400,000 years, jury's out on that, something like that. But the ability to get a notification that Will Smith has slapped Chris Rock <laughs> and we on the other side of the world and we all know within 30 seconds is insane. That is so magical slash unbearably unhealthy, right? <laughs> like, that, that is like, like Naval Ravikant said this, he said, 
for 99.9% of humans' existence, we never knew anything going on outside of a five mile radius. Mm, yeah. And now we suddenly have to have an opinion on everything, everywhere, all the time <laughs> for forever, right? And so like the point here is just that like defaults matter. They really matter now. You are an ape driven by like food and shelter and getting more bananas. And you are empowered with a technology that is way too powerful for you. Way too yes. powerful, right? So you have to find these sober moments where you treat yourself like a child. <laughs> and yeah. you have to say like, you are not emotionally capable of getting a relentless number of text message updates from ESPN and like yeah. your news site and like whatever it else it is you're, you're doing, you know? But what about you? You're getting daily sales updates. Like, don't you just want to be looking at your Stripe notifications or whatever it's coming in? Like, how do you control no. that? No, once a week. Everything, everything's once a week in a 30 minute meeting for the business. Yeah. Uh, relentlessly, un even like newsletters that I would love to follow and all that, just relentlessly unsubscribing, marking a spam, using uh, boomerang or the snooze button in, uh, in Gmail. Inbox is always, is always zero, but it's because I'm doing a ton of um, filtering, deleting, uninstalling, silencing, uh, because it's just, it's too, it's too much to give any one system all of your defaults. We're just not capable mm -hmm. of it. It's really, 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 really hard. Um, so I, I think I wrote, yeah, I wrote, um, the impossibility of the situation we found ourselves in is remarkable. The only real solution is to acknowledge how ridiculous this all is and then do the best that you can. That means taking personal responsibility for the role that technology and information plays in your life. So like when you get an unsolicited push notification from someone, you need to think like that company just paid $4 and 23 cents to send this notification to me. That's been deducted from my bank account. I, yes. and if you're okay with that, then fine, leave it. But if you're not, you need to act on that right away and uninstall it. And the only reason why we're all okay with this is because it's not actual money being deducted. It's your time. Yeah. Well, so which is your most precious resource, thinking. right? But we don't think of exactly. it that way. So I almost want to nerd like, so you have Gmail, you go to inbox zero, you're using tools like Boomerang to prune it. Like whenever, like your mobile phone, are you just like with any app, it's like no notifications. It's just really trying to be disciplined with mobile device, your phone and how you run your company. It sounds like. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, no mobile notifications at all on my phone. Um, there's maybe I so you get text messages, right? But that's like it. I would get text, yeah, uh, like text, and um, because I'm on an Android and it comes coming in on the green bubble, all my iPhone friends hate texting me anyway, so they they <laughs> <laughs> they, they barely text me. Yeah. But yeah, no notifications on the phone. Um, every morning I'll go through email, but it's always, um, the, the, the typical, um, what's it called? Paul Allen, getting things done. Yeah, Everything GT, needs to be yeah. either. Yeah. Act on acted, uh, delegated or deleted. And so it's like, go through the inbox that day and like remove everything, like do all of that. But the, the big thing is with your phone. I think when you're at your laptop, at your desktop, you have a little bit more more wiggle room there like you're kind of like more in control and you're usually there to work yeah but the phone is the real the real killer the phone yeah. is the i'm doing this one thing and i'm being interrupted sort of uh right. you, sort you've, of ins you've inspired me i will um take away some notifications i don't think i can take all of them I, so, well but so that's the key though and i actually love nerding out on this it's, this wasn't where i was planning on this going but the, the, <laughs> the point here is not that is not that notifications are bad. The point here is that unintentional yes. anything yeah. is bad. If you want it, it's fine. Of course, you should get notifications from your wife or your kids or whatever. Or of course, like if you're an absolutely, you know, massive Golden State Warriors fan and you want to see everything they tweet, like, of course, mm -hmm. do that, right? But um, letting a company's pre-installed app settings decide what you're going to do that way yeah. As a monkey who just figured out like 
<laughs> basic sentience. Like it's insane. It's we're we're so predictable. We're so predictable that letting the pre-installed settings determine your day is is just dangerous. So it's just one of these things that sort of keeps coming up in my life over and over again. Simple, but not easy. Yeah, my my partner Jonathan is so much better at that than I am. It's a little annoying too because he'll like snooze text and Slack so he can do deep work. But I like will desperately need him because some emergency because someone proactively hit me up and I get all notifications and I like can't get a hold of him for two hours. But then he comes back. He's like, oh, yeah, in that two hours, I like redesigned and developed the website. Here's this. I was like, oh, yeah, your way is so much better than mine. Um, so <laughs> when I was reading through your blog posts, I was really excited to have a hot take to put you on the hot seat and do some contrarian thinking around. I think it's wrong that you have grown this way. I was I was going to go down this path of you should have stayed and been a solo founder that runs like a Justin Welsh style business that's like one to two billion without you. But as we've talked beforehand, and we got more into the numbers, I realized that that was totally wrong, um, that you are doing the right path. And it's really impressive. <laughs> one thing that I want to hit on, and this is going to make everybody listen really angry, because it's going to make me angry. Will you tell people about what you all have done in an intentional way to run this company in the most efficient way and how many times you're actually meeting or doing deep work versus how you've been able to have free time. Um, Because I think one thing that I was impressed about with ClickMinded is when you set it up initially, it was really inspired by in, in the very positive way, the four hour work week on lifestyle design. How have you kept that with the new setup of the company? Yeah, um, everything. So it's interesting that who you take advice from is really important. So if you're, if you're, unfortunately, if you're brand new and you haven't started anything yet, you can't, um, you have to be willing to kind of like eat crap for a little bit of while and for a little bit of time and like sort of say yes to everything. That beginning phase, you have to say yes to everything. I had to say yes to everything for a very long time at the beginning, right? A lot of, a lot of physical in-person teaching of, of students and all that to like figure out the product and what people's problems were and stuff like that. But once you get to a certain point, it, it becomes suddenly important to figure out who your avatar is and then relentlessly say no to the people that aren't a good fit or your customers and also for the type of people you want to hire and your team and the type of team that you're building. Um, we have one 30 minute a week one 30 minute meeting per week on Mondays at 9 a.m. Uh, it's kind of a summary of everything we're going to do. Sometimes it's an hour. Um, anytime a client or customer says, I urgently need to call you. Um, I, I have some reservations about this. Please call me immediately right away. It's usually all caps locks. It's usually multiple exclamation <laughs> points. We relentlessly block, mark a spam, unsubscribe, don't reply, or tell them like, here's the FAQ page relentlessly. Mm -hmm. It has been so painfully obvious who's not a good fit for the business. Um, someone who doesn't read the FAQ page is a great example of someone that we do not want as a customer. They are always unhappy. They don't know what they're looking for. They often ask for refunds. It's better for them and for us for us to just tell them, please do not sign up. Mm -hmm. So we've designed the, the, the whole business is all um, asynchronous. So no one, nothing's ever due at a certain moment. There's never any meetings outside of that Monday morning meeting. Um, the team's distributed all over the place. A lot of the, the writers and people creating SOPs and stuff like that, everything's done on Asana. So it's all kind of like do it at your own, at your own sort of pace. Um, Week long and month long timelines are usually the 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 thing, right? Uh, we get requests from users, but we sort of batch them into like when we should create them, and we don't make any guarantees on when they'll be done. It's all sort mm -hmm. of designed on when we want to do it. the 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 bit The best way to think about this, like we're an informational product business, but it really is kind of like SaaS sort of development cycle and unit economics. Yeah. Um, right. Where we what's really fun as a company is like. Now everyone's doing different things, but like we have these moments where we go into development mode, where we're kind of like doing more creating and less selling, like in general. And then we switch and we go into selling mode where we're like doing more selling and less, a uh, little bit less, less development. And so that kind of like 
cycling is actually quite fun because it's it's the same thing. It's it's more simple. You're doing fewer things uh, at a higher sort of quality. Um, and so, yeah, so for us so far, it's it's worked out really well. All right, a million questions. So this Monday meeting, um, like we're, we do EOS, Entrepreneur Operating System. We have a Monday meeting. It is an hour long. Um, we go through our scorecard. Why has it worked so well that you can run your business 30 minutes a week? Is it one, because you have an amazing framework for how you run the meetings and planning? Or two, was it getting you know Andre to be the CEO to take charge? Or maybe it's a little bit of both. Yeah, it's probably a little bit of both. We looked at EOS. I read EOS. I I considered implementing it. We were kind of already half doing it in our own style, and it was really working for Andre. I, it's not that I'm not a believer in EOS. It's just that the guy who's currently running my business has a way that is working for him, totally. and there just didn't seem like a reason to interrupt that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I think the root of the I should have added this to the post. The root of the success has been a, an annual roadmap. Like we come up and agree to a full one-year plan for everything we're going to do, what our goals are. And then that's broken down into quarters. And we check on it every week. Um, we check on that every week. And we also have really good Google Data Studio, or Google Looker now, um, dashboards. So like having dashboards that track these metrics and visualizing it solves 90% of the problem. Good, I'm convinced that good data visualization is the key to most people's problems now. Whether mm. it's your business, hot take, I like it, hot take. <laughs> calorie counting, right? Whether it's like, I'm really into the smart home stuff and like just the the act of having a smart scale where you step on it and it just puts your weight in a cloud somewhere so you can check it or like an Apple watch that like checks your steps and puts it somewhere. Like the ability to just look at the problem in a, on a graph and it nine times out of 10, you'll know what the problem is. Like, oh, I'm eating candy bars at 9 p.m. at night every day. <laughs> like clearly on this, on this chart, right? But, but this becomes obvious in our business every week when we we look at our data studio dashboards and we see, oh, we're 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 under our revenue goal ten percent, or we're over our revenue goal twenty percent. We we miss this, and we just talk about it and why we missed it or why we're over it, and then we mm -hmm. we solve it. So yeah, That's I think it. the short answer to to your question is uh, an annual plan that we've all agreed to that we check in on every week with really good data visualization has gotten us very far. Gotcha. So yeah, planning. So you can think ahead. You have the, the cadence or rhythm to meet once a week and adjust and tweak that or maybe and tweak the plan. So you, after this 30 minute meeting, it's Monday at 9.30 AM or whatever time is, you have the rest of the week. What are you doing? You're no longer the CEO. What does Tommy do? <laughs> what would you don't say ask, you do here? Don't, 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 don't ask questions you don't want the answers to. Jim. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, it's it's for, for me. I've kind of been the um, at least for the last year. I've kind of been like the weird special projects guy. You know, um, yeah. I've been I've been doing a lot of the like, like weird risky bet sort of stuff. Um, while like the adults run the actual business, you know, I'm like the kid they push over into the closet. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go, but what is uh, that? Is that testing new products? Is that acquiring companies? Is that like in any color? Yeah. So, I mean, in the past, it was a lot of that stuff, right? We made a couple of site acquisitions, uh, or, or maybe a year or two ago, um, uh, stuff like, for example, Back, uh, probably start doing this again. Podcast appearances might be one of them, right? Get that um, backlink. Get that backlink. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But uh, but you know, other things like um, I've taken on uh a lot of the kind of payment processing, HR kind of like no one's really capable of doing it. So it's kind of more janitorial work uh, and sort of new problems that have shown up because we've grown a lot, and uh, so. So it's been a lot of those, but then the next phase is going to be crazy projects. So we have a couple of ideas we've been scheming on that are like wildly different um, bets 
And that's also sort of my sweet spot. I sort of like starting from zero yeah. and making things happen with, with little to no momentum. And that's kind of like Andre's worst nightmare, right? Is, is, <laughs> uh, is that sort of thing. So um, that's sort of what's on tap, but, but in general, yeah, if you're sitting here and you're thinking, okay, what would I do? I, I run my company. If I brought in a CEO, what would I do every day? The way I think about it is uh, janitor work and crazy ideas. <laughs> You know, there's there's this persona. It was Dave Kellogg. Um, he I was talking to Rob Sobers. He's a CMO of a publicly traded company, Veronas, that's on a path to one billion. And he talked about two types of people to hire. You have the like the starter upper, I forget what it's called, and then you have the scale it upper. And he's like, to really go to that next level, you need the scale it upper because the started upper, the builder, they're good, but they plateau. They're like generalists. They can put everything together. But then you need that person that can go next level. I think you can wear both those hats, but it sounds like Andre definitely fits into that category of the scale it upper. And those are the people that can be gold for someone that's really good at tinkering and building. But um, that's that's super interesting. Um, mm. I I want to, well, I know we've been talking for a long time. So like one last question I had is, you know, the, the, the growth is awesome. You're running it the right way. I'm so happy for you and jealous and envious. It's super impressive. Um, just with the structure and the discipline with the business, like what's the goal here? Like, how do we land this plane? Right. It's like, you know, you, it's going well, is it to the moon? Is it going public? It's like, Hey, let's just keep cruising along. Or are you like, we'll figure it out at the annual planning meeting. And like, how do you Andre and Eduardo have alignment on that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is, I mean, this is probably the root of why I wrote this post and the quasi therapy session stuff. And I sort of ended the post with that, with the, um, I don't know if you ever read that parable, the, 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 uh, the fisherman and the banker. Yeah. Right. Um, which is the kind of the root of, of, of everything. Um, I mean, in general right now, do you mind like, kind of summarizing that just so people know what you're talking about? It's such a good one. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a great one. It became very popular um, recently. It's like a it's like a many thousand year old parable, but it's been modernized. And the the basic idea is, I can read little clips of it. An American investment banker is at the pier of a small village in Mexico. A fisherman comes to the shore and he's pulling his fish out. And the banker says, "How long have you been fishing?" And the fisherman says, "A, a little while." The banker says, "Why don't you go go back out and catch more fish?" And he says, "Yeah, I've got all that I need. I don't need any more fish." And he says, well, what do you do with the rest of your time? Well, basically the question you just asked me, right? And, and the fisherman <laughs> says, well, well, I sleep late. I fish a little. I play with my kids. I take siestas with my wife. I stroll into the village. I drink wine with my buddies and I play guitar. I have a full and busy life. And the banker says, well, I have an MBA from Harvard and I can help you. You should spend more time fishing. With the proceeds, you can buy a bigger boat. With those proceeds, you can buy an even bigger boat. And then soon you'll have several boats. And then eventually you'll have a whole fleet. Once you have a fleet, instead of selling to a middleman, you can sell directly to the processor and eventually become your own processor. You control the product, the processing, and the distribution. <laughs> you would then need to move to Mexico City and then to LA and then eventually to New York. And the fisherman says, how long will this all take? And the banker says, 15 to 20 years. And the fisherman says, but then what? And the banker laughs and says, well, by that time, you can IPO, sell your company stock and make millions. And the fisherman says, millions, and then what? And the banker says, then you can retire and move to a small fishing village where you can sleep late, <laughs> fish with your kids, take siestas with your wife, drink wine, and play guitar with your friends. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I wrote in the post, like, this is a cute story, but it ends with a profound question. Is there a chance that you're chasing something that you already have? And I think a lot of us in, these, in our situation might be there maybe we have what we want. Um, and everyone gets to decide that for themselves, you know? And so like, yeah, I mean, the short answer, like right now I'm living the dream. <laughs> I'm having so much fun. <laughs> and if this stays exactly the, the way it is and doesn't change at all, I'm very okay with that. Yeah. So in terms of, in terms of what's, what's next, um, I have no idea, but I think it's really important to, like I said before, 
it doesn't mean you have to or not have to do something just like with your, your push notifications. It's just about making sure it's intentional and that you're doing it for the reasons that you, that you actually wanted to, you know? So, um, so right now, no, like I get the most joy out of, it's very cool to see customers that absolutely love us and we make their lives way easier. It's very cool to see people on the team growing a ton and getting super excited. It's very cool talking to people like you about how the last 10 years have gone. And so, uh, Right now, my plan is to continue to stay out of the way and and see how it goes. <laughs> Dude, it's I I just absolutely love getting your perspective on things because I think it's really easy to go down the path of what you're told. Like I was a finance major in college, it's like oh, finance major, you go work in investment banking and you do private equity and then get MBA and and that's the path. But and you're like okay, then I'm following that path because I again I'm a, a dumb monkey chasing bananas. And then I'm like oh wait, I could do something different. And I feel like you've always been quick to be like uh, let me rethink this and have an original view. And um, it's it's really refreshing because you know I think people just go down this path because it's, it's what they're told. And it's funny like when I was starting Growth Hit, I had like this kind of informal like advisory board where people didn't even know it, but they were on it where I'd call them and get advice. I had an executive coach. I had someone who's a CMO of a publicly traded company. And then I had Tommy and I would always ask the same question to the three people. <laughs> and your answer was always my favorite um, that I'd get from it. It'd be like, oh, stop doing an agency, just sell this and live your life the right way. But uh, but no, man, it's it's always so fun to to catch up and hear the latest. I hope you do more more frequent posts, but, uh, but I can't thank you enough. Hey, I want more posts out of you, man. I want to see, I want to see more growth hit, but I also see one. I want to see more like uh Jim, Jim, the dad kind of posts. I want to see uh, more dad jokes, more family man kind of <laughs> stuff. I think, I think it might be off. It might not be on brand for what you're trying to do, but I, uh, I appreciate the intermittent dad joke tweets I see from you every oh, yeah. now and then. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I do the morning drop off with my kindergartner, my five-year-old. We take our, our rad e-bike to school. No big deal. Um, I am, oh, dang. I am, I am, I am killing it with kindergarten humor. Like I know that audience so well. I got like <laughs> rolling laughs from three sets of kindergartners. It's just like, that's my people. Where's my three-year-old? Um, yeah, I got to work on new material. It is not landing well at all. <laughs> but like kindergarten, I'm getting rolling laps. Um, princess jokes. Uh, it's 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 really good. So anyway. Uh, that's incredible. I'll, I'll that's share incredible. that. That's <laughs> incredible. <laughs> uh, well, cool, man. Well, Les, how, how are we doing in New York? Is that we're there for life? I'm pretty jealous you're there. If for life, I don't know. I don't want to commit to it. <laughs> I don't want to commit to that, but, uh, but, uh, it's, it's been great. It's been really fun. I've been traveling for a lot, a lot the last five or six years. And I finally, I finally feel like I'm home. So yeah, I'm liking it a lot. that's cool, man. Um, well, cool. Well, Tommy, where, where can people find you? Where should they go? Yeah. Uh, we're at clickminded.com. You can check us out. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, thank you, Tommy. Thanks a lot, Jim. Appreciate it.